So now that we know what growth curve models are and we've learned a little bit about likelihood, let's see how we can estimate them using HLM. Linear growth curve models are pretty straightforward in HLM. Uh, the main thing we're doing is centering our time predictor at our baseline, and then we're just using time as a predictor. And in this case, I'm including random slopes based on the spaghetti plot that I saw. So now that we fit our model, we can interpret our fixed effects. So here, because our baseline is at time one, the intercept is the mean of depression at baseline. So this is an interpretable conditional mean. The slope is, as we would expect, the change in depression as time passes. So in this case, uh, depression decreases by 2.11 for every week that passes. And we can you know, think about these as z-tests. Um, this neg negative seven for the uh, time variable is, is a pretty large z-value. So this does appear to be significant. And again, here are our random effects. We've seen this several times, so I'm not going to spend too much time belaboring it here. Uh, here are the parameter interpretations for reference. So what if we expect our curve to be nonlinear? Maybe we think that the change in depression over time will change. So maybe we think that at first depression will decrease by a lot, and then it will level, level off as time passes uh, for something. Or, something like that. So this is just a hypothetical example of what that might look like. This is not actually based on the data. This is what a curved growth curve might look like. So one method for addressing nonlinear growth is to include polynomial terms for time. We can include conceptually up to t minus one polynomial terms where t is the number of time points, including baseline. So in this case, we have four time points, so we can include terms up to time to the third. Uh, one note is that in R, you need a special function to include polynomial terms, the I function. This stands for inhibit. And this is because the syntax for formulas in R actually uses a slightly different operator structure. So it, when you're in formula syntax, it sometimes thinks an operator means something different than its arithmetic meaning. So the I inhibits that and says just use the operators inside of this function as their uh, arithmetic interpretations. And note that you do need to retain lower order terms when you write the syntax, unlike with interaction. So here you see I uh, fit a model with uh, time squared by putting time squared inside of this I function. And I keep the, the linear effect of time as well. And I have random slopes for both. And here is the result I get. And keep in mind here, uh, this actual fixed effect of time squared is not significant here. but uh, something worth bearing in mind for something we're going to see in a little bit. And here again are our random effects. And note that we have correlations for all of our random effects as we expect, including between time and time squared. So one thing that comes up with polynomial terms is that we have to decide on which ones get random slopes. And this is you know, not that straightforward, because when you add polynomial terms, um, their interpretations aren't necessarily as straightforward as when you just have the linear terms. Um, and so the problem is that adding more and more random slopes can cause convergence issues. And even more, uh, remember that in HLM, what you're doing is estimating cluster-specific parameters for each cluster. And when you don't have very many observations per cluster, and you have lots and lots of random slopes, you're actually going to wind up with more parameters than observations. And that actually is exactly what happens here if we try to include uh, more than two random slopes in this model. So we can't add a third random slope. Um, that if you try to run this model, it's going to give you an error saying that you tried to estimate um, a model that has more parameters than observations, and this is not identifiable. If we did want to keep the cubic term, we would have to remove the random slope for one of our or one of our random slopes and uh, treat that polynomial as fixed. And so you see this does converge. I had to change the optimizer, but once I did, it converged. An alternative approach to nonlinear growth is known as a piecewise model. Uh, you may also see this referred to as a spline model. So what this does is it explicitly separates the slopes for different models into different segments of time. And this is done by recoding the time variable into two separate variables. And so what you're essentially saying is that I think that there's one slope for one segment of the timeline, and then one slope for the rest of the 
line of time. And you can have more than two splines or piecewise sections. Um, that's just what we're going to look at in this example. So here we're looking at uh, a situation where we're assuming that there are two different slopes for time and that the slope changes after uh, week two. So there's one slope for uh, the period between week one and week two, and then a different slope for the period between week two and four. And we're going to look at two different ways you can code a model that uh, facilitate this interpretation. So the first is to keep the original time variable as it is, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3. And then this, we create a new time variable that is coded 0, 0, 1, 2. So under this coding scheme, uh, you can interpret the slope of the first segment as just the first gamma parameter. So the parameter for time 1 is the first line segment slope. And the second line segment slope is the sum of the two parameters, so gamma 2, 0 plus gamma 1, 0. And so here we can fit this model. Uh, it actually causes uh, interesting singularity. Um, I think it's because of how highly correlated, in a sense, the two parameters are. Um, it doesn't actually produce uh, a zero estimate for any of the variances, which is what we usually see with a singularity. Um, which means there's something going on with some linear combination of the parameters. Uh, not that important. I just took one of the random slopes out and the model fits. And as we'll see, this is very similar to the results we get from our um, alternative approach. So the alternative approach, uh, we have to take a little, do a little more work up front, but it makes our interpretation easier on the back end. So here we recode both of our time variables. So the first time variable now gets coded 0, 1, 1, 1 and the second as 0, 0, 1, 2. And so essentially what we're saying here is the first variable represents the slope between you know time, time, a baseline time and week two. So we're saying that we want a slope here and then it levels off for this variable. And then here we're saying we want a consistent slope across these three time points that's level prior to that. Um, so you do have to recode both variables if you do that, but if you do it this way, um, both parameters each individually represent the slope of each segment, so it's a little bit easier to interpret. So the first segment is the first parameter, and the second segment is the second parameter. So here I code this up, um, and we can look a little bit more at how I coded this. Uh, let me look together in lab. And we see that the results are almost exactly the same. So here the first line segment is 1.91 or negative 1.91, the second line segment is negative 2.21. Um, if we look back at our previous results, remember that, so the first line segment looks the same, 1.91, and then the second one is the sum of the two. So uh, here it's, uh, you know, it's 2.21-ish once again. So we've learned that we can test nested models using the likelihood ratio test with full maximum likelihood, and that we can compare, though not formally test, non-nested models by looking at uh, their information criteria, which is uh, penalized likelihood or penalized deviance. And so here we are comparing two nested models. So the quadratic model um, is, uh, the, the, the linear model is nested within the quadratic model. And note that even though the, the fixed quadratic effect was not significant when we looked at it before, uh, this uh, likelihood ratio test is significant. And one of the reasons is we're not just testing one parameter here, we're testing four parameters because um, we're testing not just the fixed effect, but the random effects from introducing the random slope here as well. And so um, well, I think the way I would interpret this result, um, so I'm, I'm just going to try to go back really quick and we will look at what the, so here you see the quadratic effect of time was not significant in this model. The T value is really, really small, but the likelihood ratio test was. Um, so uh, I think the interpretation that I would have here is that the average of um, the cluster slopes or the, 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 the cluster curves for time was very close to zero in the quadratic effect. So it was very close to linear. The average was very close to linear. But the curvature may explain some of the individual differences. So the quadratic effect may be explaining some of the differences in the slopes uh, over time between the different clusters. So that may or may not be relevant to you, but that would be, that would be the interpretation I would make to this model. And then whether 
um, I was interested in those individual differences or just in the fixed effect would uh, help me decide which model I wanted to retain. So uh, we also note that um, the AIC for the quadratic model is slightly smaller, but the BIC for the linear model is quite a bit smaller. Um, we talked a little bit about this. BIC is typically going to be more, a little bit more conservative. It's going to be more likely to side with the model with fewer parameters. AIC is going to be a little bit more liberal, liberal about permitting more parameters. The bottom line is these models are extremely similar. Um, they're not. There's actually not that big a difference between them. You can make a case for either one, depending on uh, your needs. So here we're going to look at two non-nested models. So we're going to look at um, the linear model compared to the second piecewise model. So remember, in the second piecewise model, um, we recoded both time variables to uh, facilitate interpretation. But what that means is we no longer the linear model is no longer a special case of the piecewise model. And so we can't interpret the likelihood ratio test directly here, but we can interpret the AIC and BIC. And what we see is that the AIC and BIC are both lower for the linear model. That tells us that in this case, we prefer the linear model.